Thank you, Mark, and thank you all. Thank you guys for join us, joining us this November for the All Bugs, Good and Bad webinar. And Dr. Benson, thank you so much for being here. Dr. Benson is a professor of entomology from Clemson University. He received his bachelor's degree in animal science from the University of Vermont and his master's degree in biology from Fairleigh Dickinson University and his PhD in entomology from Clemson in 1988 working in research and development for Syngenta in Switzerland and Dow Chemical. He worked as an extension entomologist at Auburn University, War Eagle, when he returned to Clemson in 1997. He has responsibilities for research and education programs concerning household and structural pests in South Carolina. And for 14 years, you could hear him on the South Carolina radio show, Your Day, answering questions about bugs. And when he's not out chasing bugs, he enjoys hiking, walking his dogs, and expanding a tree house he's built for his grandkids. And Dr. Benson, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm going to start off with a video. It's not going to be nearly as exciting as uh, B-52s in Love Shack, and uh, I hope by the end of the presentation you don't think my tin roof is too rusty. But I kind of wanted to start with this short little... Uh, IPM video on pantry pests from the University of California. I think we'll set the stage and then we'll hop into the, the PowerPoint and take it from there. Do you have moths flying around your kitchen or insects crawling inside food packages or containers? If so, you might have pantry pests. Pantry pests can be moths, beetles, or other insects that infest stored food products such as flour, grains, nuts, sweets, and other pantry items. There are several types of pantry pests, including the Indian meal moth, cigarette beetle, rice weevil, warehouse beetle, and other beetles such as flower beetles and grain beetles. Telltale signs of an infestation include webbing or tiny holes in the food item or package. The larvae and adults of some insects produce secretions that give food a disagreeable odor or taste. Often, by the time you notice pantry pests, they have already infested open packages or products that have been on the shelf for long periods of time. If you find the main source of the pest infestation before it spreads to other packages, pantry pest control is relatively easy. Simply seal up the infested container or package and throw it away. To eliminate a pantry pest infestation, first inspect all food packages and destroy any that show signs of infestation. Then remove everything from your shelves and wash the shelves with soap and water. Vacuum corners or crevices to remove hidden crumbs and any pest eggs and pupae. Prevent future pantry pest infestations by inspecting new purchases of packages and bulk food items, storing food in containers with tight fitting lids, and frequently cleaning up any spills or crumbs. Monitor for any future pantry pests using sticky pheromone traps available at most garden centers and hardware stores. For more information on how to prevent and control pantry pests, visit the UCIPM website. So I wanted to use that to set the stage uh, to talk about pantry pests, carpet beetles, and clothes moths today. And you know, quite frankly, pantry pests, carpet beetles, and clothes moths may not be the most exciting uh, insect pests that we deal with, but they may be some of the most frustrating, especially for uh, the average homeowner. And so today I'm really going to focus on uh, the outline for pantry pests in relation to stored product pests. And I'm going to start off with some general background, some key pests, and certainly we can't cover them all in the time we're allotted today, and control options. This will be the bulk of the uh, presentation. We could take a short break to answer some questions at that point in time. Uh, and then I'll move into some selected carpet beetles and clothes moths. This will be a much shorter section. Again, I'll follow general background key pests, some uh, control options for those, and uh, finish up the, uh, the webinar. You know, it's always been amazing to me about how much food we lose in the world after we get it out of the fields. You know, everything that the, the grower goes through to get a healthy crop out of the fields 
and into storage, and yet we still lose 5 to 10% of the world's food supply each year. Annual losses in the United States are estimated over a billion dollars, and in some subtropical countries, uh, the, the loss of uh, food can be even 30 to 50%. By and large, the stored product pests or the pantry pests that we deal with, uh, that I deal with as an extension specialist, are the, the beetles and the moths. They're the two most important groups, uh, though there are others that we just won't cover today, but we certainly can answer questions if there are any. And before we get started, I just wanted to make sure that when we're talking about beetles and we're talking about moths, we remember they're the types of insects with what we call holometabolis or a complete metamorphosis. That means there's an egg stage, a larva stage, uh, like a caterpillar or a grub. Those caterpillars or grubs are gonna eventually pupate, and then there's the adult stage. The larvae and the adults may or may not feed on the food. The larvae and the adult, adult stage may or may not be in the same environment. And it's important to know when you're dealing with the pests, and I'll try to highlight where they're the same and where they're different. The bottom line when it comes to stored product pest management is an ounce of prevention is really worth a pound of cure. Uh, anything you can do to pre uh, prevent the pest in the first place, avoid it in the first place, will go a long way. We're going to talk about sanitation and so on and so forth, which is great. But the best control strategy is trying to avoid having the pest get in in the first place because once a pest gets in, once it gets established, it's going to do everything it can do to survive and stay there. So generally a plan is essential. Now for our pest professionals out in the audience, uh, you're probably aware of hazard analysis and critical control points. Uh, many of these regulated by the FDA or the USDA, where basically in the food industry, you're setting up critical control points that can be taken to reduce or eliminate the risks of any hazard in the food establishment, including a lot of the insect pests. There's also the National Pest Management 2013 Management Standards for Food Plants. And if you haven't looked at that and you are working in commercial facilities, I would suggest that you go to either one of the, the two websites that I've put up in this PowerPoint and uh, look at that information if you're not familiar with it. But it really does stress in both cases having a plan for prevention. But most of us, a lot of us are master gardeners today, uh, extension agents, our resources are going to be fact sheets. This is just literally a screenshot off my computer of one of our fact sheets. And I spent a bit of time this last week going around to different land grant universities, uh, looking at fact sheets on fabric pests, on pantry pests in general, and there's quite a few out there. So I would say uh, if you do do a web search uh, on fabric pests, pantry pests, carpet beetles, whatever, look for those EDU extensions, look for those rent land grant schools, and you'll probably find some good information. And then my standbys on my desk right here, and I touch these books almost every day, the uh, Handbook of Pest Control by Malice, that's the Bible of Pest Control, the National Pest Management Field Guide to Structural Pests, and even the Pest Control Technology PCT series uh, are very good books for information. This little PCT series is actually a two-part series on mostly beetles that infest structures, but spends a lot of time on pantry pests and control. So before we get into the current realm, I want to just take a short step back to 1668 and Francesco Reddy. Reddy, I would have liked to have met him, I think, because he was an Italian physician and a poet. And I think that would be so cool to go to your doctor and have him recite poetry to you as he's probably poking you with something. But Reddy really was uh, also an early entomologist, so he probably didn't call himself that. And back at the time, uh, people believed in spontaneous generation, that, that things would just appear by magic, if you will. And Reddy uh, did an experiment, because he didn't believe this, where he had a bottle with meat in it and a screen over the top. And he had a bottle with meat in it and no screen over the top. And he showed that where there was no screen, eventually flies spontaneously uh, generated from the meat. But where they were excluded, they didn't generate. And this disproved the, the theory of spontaneous generation. So why the heck am I going back to 1668 to talk about spontaneous generation? Because I get so many uh, callers uh, 
people emailing about their frustrations with pantry pests that will say, I have an absolutely a spotless house. There is absolutely nothing here for them to eat. They're, I just don't know where they're coming from. And I understand the frustration, and we're going to talk about some of those hidden locations, but if the pest is there, there's no such thing as spontaneous generation. They have to be getting food at some location. But it can be difficult to find because pantry pests have feeding habits that are fairly diverse. We have some that are internal feeders that are within the grain, and if you're not inspecting the grain or you've forgotten about it, you don't even see them in there. Uh, we have external feeders that feed outside the kernel, then scavenger groups that eat broken grain, and then secondary uh, pests that are often in damp or moldy grain. So lots of times when people call, I say, do you know what it is? And, and if it's a moth or if it's a beetle, they usually do. Um, and then if they say, yes, yeah, it's, it's a moth or it's a, it's a beetle, I will often say, have you seen it fly? Uh, because some of them fly and some of them don't. And now I may not know what the pest is, whether they say yes or no, I've seen it fly, but it starts to help me eliminate what it's probably not, depending on their answer. And then does it go to lights? That's another one, because some of these pests go to lights, a lot of them do, but there's some particular uh, pantry pests that don't go to light. So it helps you to sleuth out uh, the path that you're going to take and trying to figure out what's going on. I had a tough time uh, just deciding which internal feeders to uh, include, and I'm really only including two groups because of time. But internal feeders are any of these insect pests that uh, the larvae develop within the kernel of the whole grains or whole seeds instead of processed grains. And uh, two main groups are the rice and granary weevils. And I said beetles are the most common group. Well, weevils are a type of beetle. And then the angmoa grain moth. Granary weevils and rice weevils are very, very similar in appearance. It's hard to tell them apart. The granary weevil has these little pits on the back of their head or their prothorax and they're more oval, whereas the rice weevil has more round patches or pits on their back. Again, they're hard to tell apart because they're both similar in shape, though the granary weevil's nose is a bit longer. They're both about an eighth of an inch in, in length, but here's a key difference. The granary weevil does not fly and moves very slowly, but it does not fly. The, the rice weevil is a good flyer and is attracted to light. So that right away, if it's some sort of weevil and we're not sure what it is, uh, the flying or the not flying will help me figure it out. Now, Justin up in Providence, Rhode Island, when he's getting off the river walk out there uh, and he gets a call on granary or something in, in whole seeds, it's probably the granary weevil because granary weevils are mostly found north of, of North Carolina. Whereas down here in South Carolina and more southern climes, we tend to see the rice weevil. Again, both are very similar in the damage that they do and the types of things that they infest. They can be literally brought in on corn or wheat or rice that's brought into the home. But in residential situations, they'll often get in dried arrangements, uh, bird seed, whole corn, and Indian corn. And in fact, this is the time of year uh, approaching Thanksgiving when we get some calls on these pests because people will be going in and pulling out dried arrangements, wreaths. Uh, um, in our house, we have Indian corn, you know, different attractive colors of corn that my wife hangs on the door. And those things are just primed for getting some of these pests in them because by and large for most of the year, they're sitting in a box in some undisturbed place and are perfect, if you will, for the picking or the feeding of the females which the females, once they've, they've come out of a kernel after pupating, uh, within 24 hours, uh, they're, they're going to mate, and shortly thereafter, they're going to start to chew holes in grain and deposit an egg inside, and then they're going to seal it up with this gelatinous material, which makes it very hard to see. The larvae inside is going to hatch out of the egg and spend its whole life cycle within that seed, eating it, eventually pupate, and then chew its way out. So in a relatively short period of time, with a lifespan of about four to five months, rice weevils and granary weevils can do a tremendous amount of damage by the time that you see it. And often by the time that people see it, the, uh, the grain that's been infested is probably uh, too damaged to do anything other than probably discard it. Then the other internal feeder is a moth, the Angamois grain moth. Uh, this is second in importance uh, to, only to the rice and granary weevils. In homes, it tends to get in a birdseed cereal. 
Ah, and rat baits. I, rat baits can be a bane for folks because a lot of the pests that I'm going to talk about will get into rat baits and they're not harmed by the bait at all. And you're like, why would they get into a rat bait? Well, a lot of the baits, especially the older baits, have grain in it. And in the olden days, people used to uh, take rat bait packages with grain and, of course, lace with a toxicant, but that's toxic to the vertebrate rat, not the insects. And in a lot of these hidden places, uh, these insects can get established and infest a home. So that's one of those places where this magical, spontaneous generation can occur, especially when people buy a house and they didn't know the previous owners at one point had, say, a mouse problem, and they put rat baits and wall voids and ceiling voids and such, and then these different pests get established in those locations. So when you can't find the obvious locations, start to think about things like rat baits in hidden locations. And we'll talk about some other things, especially nesting vertebrates and walls and what they can do, or even bee or wasp nests. Going back to our angon grain moth, they're about a half inch, kind of unspectacular moth, sort of, and most of them are, sort of buff in color. They, they have these uh, very fringy haired wings though, and they'll lay their eggs in clusters near the seeds. When the, when the little caterpillar hatches out of the seeds, then they'll each bore into one of the grain and then go through their whole life cycle within the grain. So the, the adults do not do damage, it's the caterpillars that do the damage, but obviously the adults are the ones laying the eggs. They do fly and they are attracted to lights. And as far as pantry pests go as an extension specialist, the external feeders are probably the ones that I get the most calls on. In fact, the number one insect that I get to identify is the drugstore beetle. I mean, I get a lot of cockroaches and termites and ants and spiders. But the drugstore beetle uh, is probably my mainstay with a cigarette beetle right behind. And the most common pantry pest that I get contacted about is the Indian meal moth. The Indian meal moth is the most common uh, food infesting moth found in homes and grocery stores. So that's not surprising. And many people can identify it because it kind of makes it easy. Rather than just being sort of a drab pale gray or brown, it, it uh, at least obliges us by being two-tone and rather interesting looking with sort of pale gray front parts of its wings and then a reddish brown back part. The eggs are laid by the adult near the food materials. Uh, they're, they're very tiny uh, and they can worm their way when they hatch in into many types of packaging like cellophane or improperly sealed containers. They'll go into the grain. They can have a life cycle as short as four weeks. Uh, but within 10 weeks, they certainly can go through a life cycle. So in a very short period of time, you can have overlapping generations and a pretty decent population of Indian meal moths. The adults are good flyers and attracted to lights. The larvae are sort of these little dirty white uh, half inch uh, caterpillars or worms, but they make the webbing. That's what most people notice. The webbing and then their frass is what really makes the food unpalatable and unusual, unusable. Um, with heavy infestations, the larvae will especially move out of the food to pupate. Lots of insects move out of their food to pupate, but uh, Indian meal moths are one. And I have a little pantry uh, in the corner here. What people don't realize is if, if an Indian meal moth or a lot of other insects that are pupating leave their food, they're going to start crawling up. Many crawl up and they keep going until they hit a horizontal surface. When I go into a pantry for sleuthing out a uh, Indian meal moth problem, one of the first things I'll do is look up at the ceiling and where the wall and the ceiling join, you will sometimes in bad infestations find the cocoons of the Indian meal moth. So that's a great place to look. But then you have to find where the grain may be down below. Or sometimes those cocoons are hidden because in the shelving here, if the Indian meal moths were down low and they crawl up, they'll crawl up to the underside of the shelf to pupate. So unless you get down on your hands and knees to do a really good inspection, you won't see those uh, cocoons. So a lot of people miss that because they're looking up at this height here, you know, the average height for someone, but they, they don't see here or here or here or down there. So those are key places to look. So besides the Indian meal moth, the drugstore beetles and cigarette beetles are very common, very similar in, in size, uh, in shape, and in what they can feed on. There are a few differences. Uh, you don't usually see the little C-shaped larvae, but you might in a bad infestation. Cigarette beetles are a little hairier and a little fuzzier. 
cigarette beetles are also a little smoother with hairs, whereas the drugstore beetle, you have to look closely, has more of lines and little, little punctuated marks along its back wings in this location. One of the what main ways that I tell them apart is if I can get them under a hand lens is the drugstore beetle is going to have a three segmented club antennae, whereas a drug a cigarette beetle is going to have more of a saw shaped antennae. So that's one of the key things that an entomologist is going to look at. It can be seen with a naked eye and it certainly can be seen with a hand lens. But if you're not sure, you might need to send it to somebody with a microscope. Just backing up a little bit. Um, again, they're both about the same size, about an eighth of an inch. The adults can fly and are attracted to lights for the drugstore beetle. Life cycle is about seven months. And this is a group, hence the name drugstore, that can eat almost anything. So almost any organic food, spices, red flour, breakfast cereals, poisons, rat bait, strychnine, belladonna. They've even been found in mumpy, mummies, preserved mummies. And of course, they can eat all kinds of drugs. So really an incredible uh, insect species. And so is the cigarette beetle. Again, very similar, also can fly attracted to lights. They can be specialists on tobacco, which is to toxic to most any other insect but not to the cigarette beetle. And again, they'll eat on peppers, raisins, cocoa, vegetables, pyrethrum, which is an insecticide, book bindings, leather, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So those are the main pests that we tend to see. Uh, after that, then it's probably the scavengers that I see quite a bit of. They can only attack processed grain or grain that's been damaged by the feeding of other insects in general. Uh, this includes the red and confused flower beetles, the sawtooth grain beetle, merchant grain, and the Mediterranean flower moth. Kind of like the drugstore beetle and the cigarette beetle, the red and confused flower beetles are very similar in appearance and very hard to tell apart, even for an entomologist. Uh, I always have to look closely because uh, they're both about an eighth of an inch in length. They both have a very similar two to three month life cycle. The adults in the larvae feed book both feed on, on the food. It's quite uh, slight, the differences. The red flower beetle has a slightly enlarged three-clubbed antennae, as we call it, whereas the confused flower beetle has a more gradual club. It's not quite as abrupt. And I wish there was, were some easy characters than that as far as their appearance, but there's not. But there is a significant difference. The red flower beetle is common in the south, so again, I'm probably gonna see it a lot more than Justin up in Providence, and they're strong flyers. The confused flower beetle is more common in the north, but it does not fly. So when I'm trying to diagnose the problem, and before I've gotten there, or I've gotten a specimen, I'm gonna to wanna to know, is this thing flying or not flying? And that's gonna help me figure out which it is, red or confused flower beetles. They both are common pests of cereal products, peas, beans, spices, cayenne pepper. They'll get in herbarium, uh, you know, sort of uh, preserved plant material, and even museum specimens. So they're a pretty diverse group. Then another one in this group, uh, fairly common to a lot of people, is the sawtooth grain beetle. Uh, this is probably one of the other most common uh, pantry pest beetles that I get, quite small, an eighth of an inch, sort of a drab brown color. And they have saw teeth, if you will, on the side of their, their prothorax, six saw teeth. But there's other beetles that sort of have these little bumps or saws down the side. So one way to tell the sawtooth grain beetle, and again, it's kind of slight, but uh, they have a little knob back here behind their eye by their temple. So, uh, it, you know, we just had Halloween. Think about Frankenstein. You know, Frankenstein had those little knobs on his neck. Well, they have a little bit of a knob, but, but not uh, much of one. I'm going to show you an insect that has a bigger knob, more like Frankenstein. Um, but they have a life cycle. And look at this, one month to one year. And, you know, when you read about life cycles in the literature, you'll notice things that can be really wide and variable. And it's not that anybody's wrong. I believe that both um, research projects that were probably done on how quickly they develop are accurate. But if conditions are just perfect, a lot of these pests can go through their life cycle quite quickly. If things are not so good, 
they're not going to oblige us by leaving or dying. They often will just extend out their developmental period. So uh, they're very adaptable. But again, with a lot of these insects, if they have a one month, two month, three month life cycle, you can get many overlapping generations in a short period of time uh, in a year's process. They will attack uh, processed grains, damaged grains, typically flowers, so, so more of just the, the dust and the debris that's left behind. They basically are scavengers. They're well-developed wings, but they don't fly, and they're not attracted to lights. Now, very closely similar, and I've been seeing more of these in the, sim in the last um, few years, is the merchant grain beetle. Again, it looks a lot like the sawtooth grain beetle, but this is our Frankenstein right here. See that little knob? It extends past the eye. It's more protective. I know it's not uh, a big difference, but uh, if it is a merchant grain beetle, they do tend to prefer nuts and oil seeds a little bit more than our sawtooth grain beetle. So. Um, if I have merchant grain, I'm going to be looking for those, those items as well. And also, the other key thing, sawtooth grain beetle does not fly. The merchant grain beetle can fly and are attracted to lights. And then the Mediterranean flower moth, uh, it's just sort of a drab gray moth, but it does sort of have a Charlie Brown zigzag. Remember Charlie Brown's shirt? with a zigzag. Uh, this one inch gray moth at least has a zigzag pattern and, which is really cool, it flies in a zigzag pattern. So sometimes people will tell you that was this moth was flying and it was like going back and forth. So it's a behavioral characteristic that you can use for identifications. They are good flyers, they are attracted to lights, and they again, they will be pests of flour, cereal, biscuits, dog food, nuts, seeds, so on and so forth. In this case, they're a little like the Indian meal moth in that the larvae produce webbing, but these guys will produce copious amounts of webbing, and they are very mobile. They will move in and out of food sources. So lots of times where they get established, the webbing will be quite extensive. And in fact, in commercial facilities, it could become so extensive, it um, actually gums up machinery. And I almost didn't add this, but I actually have had some calls in the last section of my pantry pests are uh, the secondary pests. Now, secondary pests only or generally infest products that are damaged, uh, quite a bit damaged, and usually very moist and very moldy. So lots of times, the product is already shot as far as trying to save it from moisture and mold. But sometimes people have forgotten uh, produce or grain in their house and, and they don't know it until one of these insects show up and start to cause a problem. So I just have a few examples here. Uh, and I put this one in because I've been seeing it a little more often, the foreign grain beetle. Uh, it's again, it's just sort of like so many of these other little tiny beetles, about an eighth of an inch. They're kind of flattened in their body shape, brown. They do have a three segmented club. At first you might, you know, people will look at this and say, is that a confused flower beetle? Um, and so you're probably going to need uh, identification, but um, if you have a foreign grain beetle, then what you're probably going to have somewhere is some pretty damp grain or seeds, uh, mold, will even also feed on uh, raw plant material, including uh, cocoa. They're a strong flyer. Uh, they're common in, in farm stored grains, so sometimes people that have uh, Oh, that live in a more rural setting sometimes will get these coming out from their farm areas into their home. And as I said, I've been seeing it a little more often. Yellow and dark mealworms is another group. Uh, they're very common insects. Actually, don't see them that often in the pantry. I almost didn't include them. They're more of a problem in places like poultry facilities. Uh, but people do rear these a lot for uh, feeding for pets, uh, for lizard food. We, we keep colonies for that for that reason, uh, lizards or your tarantula. Uh, but if, if some of these yellow or dark mealworms, and they're usually about an inch in length, kind of dark in color, cylindrical beetles with pretty strong antennae, and the, the immature the larvae are almost like a, a, a wire worm looking shape. It's not a true wire worm, but they're, they're quite heavily sclerotized and pretty stout. They're not soft and squishy like a lot of the caterpillars. If they are in a house situation, they probably have a moisture problem. 
And I hadn't had one of these in a while, but I just had one last week, and it was uh, grain mites. And there's a host of different grain and flower mites that will get into moldy grain. The adults are very tiny, one sixty-fourth of an of an inch or or smaller. So lots of times people don't even notice them, and and sometimes you'll go in and you'll see this moldy grain, and then it, you can see it moving, and it will be this mass of mites. They're not going to survive in anything that has low humidity. I mean, they like high humidity and very moldy grain. And really, they're not feeding on the grain, but on the fungi that, that grows on the grain. And this, they can cause human dermatitis. And I'm actually one person, I've experienced this um, when we've had our dog food that we feed to our cockroach colonies uh, get a little long in the tooth, get moldy, and reaching in to feed cockroach colonies. I got the typical grocer's itch, which is, uh, again, these mites causing some dermatitis on human skin. So I know that was quick, uh, but when we're talking about their management, I mean, basically, doing working with pantry pests, store product pests in general, it's classic integrated pest management. And the key thing is prevention. We're going to talk about that briefly here. And then monitoring. And if you have to, control. But your, your goal is to prevent them by monitoring and avoiding the control strategies. I took this straight out of uh, one of our commercial talks on stored product pests because really what you would do in a commercial situation and even your home overlaps quite a bit. Sanitation, keeping things cleaned up. Again, sanitation alone, once a pest gets established, we won't get rid of it. Uh, you probably have to do something else, but it certainly can help reduce the problem, make it harder on the pest to survive with less to eat. And uh, if you can keep a place uh, in good condition, you may help avoid getting the pest in the first place, excluding um, for us, you know, with those containers, tight uh, fitting containers. Um, checking things, trying to have things well sealed, proper lighting, not so much maybe for the average homeowner, but if they have lights on in a place and they're drawing pests in, a lot of these pests live outside our houses. And if you're drawing pests into lights, uh, they could then get into your pantry. So sometimes moving lights away from doors and pointing a light at the door rather than having it over the door can help. Proper storage, again, keeping things in tight containers and not keeping too many things. Temperatures, keeping things at moderate temperatures. Sometimes high temperatures can lead to higher moisture problems. Uh, so moderate temperatures. In some cases, if you have moisture problems, ventilation. Stock rotation. It were, it's important for someone in a warehouse. It's important for a homeowner with their pantry. If you, if you just keep putting cereal on top of that old cereal on top of that old cereal and you don't recycle it out, you can get pests in that old stock. Dog biscuits, you know, you keep adding the dog biscuits on top of the, the biscuits on the bottom and you never rotate it through, you can be asking for problems. So rotating the food and inspecting the food. There's lots of monitors out there, uh, just uh, many. So it all depends on what you want to use. There's some for the moss. There's some for the moss and the beetles. Some have pheromones, some have food, some are just straight sticky traps. I just wanted to point out the monitors are not for control. They help a little bit, but really what they're doing is detecting the pests. But if you have these monitors out and you go into your pantry and you say, uh-oh, you know, I haven't had anything in it and now I have three of these moths or three of these beetles now, I better need, I better inspect and better do something because you can nip the, the problem in the bud if you catch it early on with these monitors. So some things you can do, purchase dry foods in smaller quantities. A lot of us like to go to Costco and get that special deal on bulk food, but uh, if you can't use it probably within a couple of months, you really ought to think twice about buying huge quantities. Uh, if you are going to buy a lot of stuff, make sure it has good packaging, that it's not broken. Uh, these insects, are they have nothing better to do than try to get into your food. That's what they do for a living. So they're going to try to find a way if your containers are not well sealed. You might want to store things in, uh, it better in larger quantities in, in a freezer if you can and it won't damage the food. Again, rotate the food and keep those foods, all kinds of foods, in sealed containers. Discard. Oh, and in the video, you know, they're throwing away the food and they're throwing it away in the trash can in the kitchen. I would have taken that bag of infested food directly outside. And I might have even put it in the freezer for a couple days and then thrown it outside. Never underestimate 
the ability of a bug to get out of a plastic bag. And if you're gonna freeze, freezing is great, but it's not just 32 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. 27 degrees or colder is better. The colder, the better. And usually at least three to seven days. You know, the larvae and the adults of many of these things are easy to kill, but the eggs are harder and anything pupating is harder. So you need cold temperatures and usually extended times. Reduce clutter. In, I've been chasing pests now for 25, 30 years, and we always talk about food, water, shelter. Food, water, shelter. Yes, pantry pests need food and they need in shel uh, water, but more and more I'm coming to realize that a lot of pest problems um, pertain to the clutter. And if you notice the pantry that was in that video, that was a very cluttered pantry. And when you have cluttered pantries, there's a lot of uh, three dimensions for the insects to get back into and things to be forgotten and left behind in that clutter. So reducing clutter goes with that cleaning up surfaces and then vacuuming. And to me, the vacuuming is very important in those cracks and crevices, especially uh, with a crack and crevice nozzle to remove food. You're trying to remove eggs, you're trying to remove adults. And if you have to, and I, you know, I usually recommend to people try to not go the chemical route if at all possible. You can usually do things through sanitation and monitoring and cleaning and all the non-chemical control options we've mentioned. But there are many products labeled, they're just out there. So if they're gonna be used, I would say, one, follow label directions, make sure it's labeled for the site. And usually you're not, you're not spraying large areas. If, if, if anything, you might do a small spot treatment and on the labels it usually says not to exceed two square feet. But the main thing would be crack and crevice treatment, maybe with a little spray or a little dust. And the idea is if there's some eggs, small larvae that have gotten down in some cracks and crevices and you couldn't clean them out and you couldn't vacuum them out and you wanted a little residual there, that could be a spot for that location. So with that, that's the pantry pest section. Uh, again, my closed moth sections will be a little bit quicker and shorter with the carpet beetles added, but I wanted to see if there were any questions um, on the pantry pests. So if you guys, if you can, if you can see the question and answer, you can go ahead and type your question in there and we'll get that to Dr. Benson. Danny, do you want me to just keep going for now? Finish up? Sure, but yes, please go ahead. Okay, so if you're sending in your questions, we'll just move on again. This is going to be a shorter section. Um, but I did struggle with it, you know, clothes moths and carpet beetles. There's so many pests that get into uh, natural fibers uh, and including um, paper uh, there, and museum specimens. Um, but you know we don't we don't have time. But I just threw a couple pictures in. You know, so, so, so silverfish are out there, book lice, which a lot of homeowners don't know what a book louse is or looks like. Those are some that could be talked about. But right now we're just going to focus on the clothes moths and a couple carpet beetles. We use the term for carpet beetles rather broadly to cover a group, which we also generally refer to as dermestid beetles. And dermestid beetles are an amazing beetle group that can eat almost anything organic. Dealing with clothes moths and carpet beetles, again, it's, it's IPM, it's identification of the pest, inspection, sanitation, mostly non-chemical strategies, only if absolutely necessary um, treatment. And you know what? It never ends. You're always monitoring because you're never going to uh, eradicate these pests from the environment. Yes, you may get them out of your closet, your house, that's a good thing, but you're never going to get them out of your environment and they're out there, they're outside my window right here as I'm speaking, and you have to be vigilant and monitor for that prevention. So the webbing clothes moths, often called the common clothes moths, adults are kind of uh, dramatic, uh, golden color, half inch, they're kind of cute though, they kind of have a little tuft of uh, red hair, uh, and so like they, you know, they dyed their hair nice red and sort of foofed it up for you. So I know that sounds silly, but that's actually one of the characters to help identify it. There's another one, look at this life cycle, one month to four years. Uh, and I was, really, uh, but it just shows you uh, their ability to adapt to their environment. The larvae like to live in silken tubes, grazing on fibers, and usually these, the clothes moths, they do more grazing than chewing holes into things. They can chew holes, 
but lots of times it's grazing. Uh, they mostly go after wool or natural fibers, feather, uh, fur, but mostly wool. Once in a while, they will eat what would be inedible to them, like cotton fibers, maybe even uh, some of the synthetic fibers, but it's not the fibers they're eating. It's usually when there's been soiled food on it and they're actually eating the food material on those fibers that would not normally, uh, would not have any uh, nutrition for them. The adults do not feed, uh, but they do fly. It's the larvae though that, that do the damage. But interestingly, they're not attracted to lights. And then the case making clothes moths. It's a little less important than the clothes moths. Actually, I probably see it a little more often. Uh, the adults are very similar um, to the webbing clothes moths, except rather than the cute little tuft of hairs on their head, they're a little balder like me, and they have uh, spots on their wings. They also have a fringe of hairs on the back. Their life cycle is listed as a little more uh, reasonable. But I love this, larvae with adventitious clothing. That means that their case that they're making really is a house, really covers them, almost like a snail in its shell. Whereas the webbing clothes moth, their case is much looser. They, they will drag fibers around with them. They're a little more mobile than the, the uh, case-making clothes moths. Uh, but they still make a case, but again, the webbing clothes moth is, is more like a web than a case. So that's one way to tell them apart. For the case-making clothes moths, the adults don't feed either, but they, they, are, um, they fly and are also not attracted to lights. I often find that people think the adult is making the holes in their clothes. It's not, they don't feed. It's the caterpillar, and the caterpillar doesn't leave the material. It's somewhere on the material. But if you have this adventitious clothing, you can hide literally under the material. So lots of times if they're on woolen suits, uh, you know, clothing that people have put in a closet unprotected for long periods of time because it's spring, summer, or fall, and they're not getting it out till now, these things will get under lapels uh, in sort of in out-of-the-way places, and unless you're really looking for it, you don't notice it until there's a significant amount of grazing damage and maybe some holes. And then finishing up, the furniture carpet beetles, uh, carpet beetles in general. So I'm just going to highlight three. They're all about the same size. Um, uh, we all often like to say the larvae kind of look like hairy carrots. Uh, they're kind of longitudinal and they'll have different kinds of hairs. And for an entomologist with a microscope, you can make um, diagnostic decisions and differences between the species based on the hairs. The average person can't see these differences without magnification. Uh, the patterns too uh, can kind of look the same. The furniture carpet beetle, you know, is sort of white and black and orange. And life cycle, look again, three months to two years. They can feed on almost anything organic. Hair, fur, feathers, hides, stored grains, nuts, so on and so forth, and damage insect collections. They are the bane, especially the furniture carpet beetle, of insect collections that are not protected because the insect collections are natural products that they can eat. The adults do not feed. Uh, it's the, on, on the uh, stored products, it's the uh, immatures that do that. The adults are very good flyers, and they feed on plant pollen. They avoid light, and they're out in the environment. The varied carpet beetle is very similar to the furniture carpet beetle. You can sort of see the color patterns. It's slightly different. The hairs on the back of the larvae are slightly different. You may not need to know the differences between the two, but this is one beetle that sometimes I will see infesting the house, and what it turns out to be is a carcass is in a wall void. A squirrel died, a raccoon died, or the classic, and I put it in big letters so I wouldn't forget, a bee, a honeybee colony, or a yellow jacket nest was once in a wall void and that was treated and killed, and they never sealed it up or removed it. And once those insecticides break down, these carpet beetles, especially the very carpet beetle, can secondarily infest that old bee or wasp colony or that dead animal and cause an infestation in the structure. And this can drive people crazy because it's, again, where could these things possibly be coming from? And then the last one, the black carpet beetle, uh, again, is pretty easy to identify compared to the other two. It's, it's oval in shape, black in color, 
kind of that hairy carrot shape again and feeds on a wide variety of food sources. And I added one last one. I could have put this in the pantry pest. This is another domestic beetle, but we call it the larder beetle or hide beetle. It's oval, black with a yellow stripe, hairy larvae, but this is one that will feed on uh, leather, horns, feather, skin, and when the larvae go to pupate, most go off and pupate in some sort of uh, the fibers that they're feeding on. This actually will go to find wood and bore into wood. So sometimes in pantry session settings, people will see these beetles and they think they're eating the wood. It's not. It's just the larder beetle larvae chewing out a place to pupate and then come out. So technically they're not eating the wood, they're just excavating it. So again, finishing up carp beetles and clothes moths, identification is critical. There are different types of traps that you can be that you can be put out, but remember they may not be obvious. They may be in a bird's nest, old rodent nest, uh, baits, abandoned hives, dead animal carcasses. Chemical control strategies are there, but the non-chemical control strategies, whenever possible, are the best. What does that mean? Change the environment. Inspect for them. Use and move. They do not like movement. So if you're using your clothes, moving your clothes, cleaning your clothes, that's one of the best control strategies. If you're not using a cloth item, make sure you clean it properly before you put it up and then put it in something that's going to give exclusion with proper storage. You, cedar chests are an old standby. The cedar can be toxic. It depends on the type of cedar and how strong it is. It's actually a chest that really closes tightly. That is the best part of a cedar chest or some of these airbags that you can get. If you clean your clothing really well, either dry cleaning it or if you can clean it at home and then get it in some of these well-sealed airtight chests or bags, you can really avoid carpet beetle and clothes moths problems. Higher humidity is bad, so if you can reduce the humidity. Sanitation, again, uh, people can literally go in and clean up their clothing or even vacuum their clothing, carpeting anything where these pests may be living or feeding. Dry cleaning, and in some cases, just like you can freeze food, you can freeze uh, cloth and, and fabric if you can get it into a freezer. Chemical control, try to avoid it, uh, but I mean, there are sprays and dusts, uh, labeled for it. You, uh, there are still of uh, these uh, low vapor aerosols like DDVP, uh, Vapona. Some of us older people remember the, the uh, uh, pest strips, which is not a fumigation. What it is, is an organophosphate insecticide in an enclosed environment, has a low vapor pressure and volatilizes into the closet or wherever it is killing the insect. So you're basically using an insecticide vapor, not a true fumigation, but a vapor in those tight settings. And then again, not my favorite, but the mothballs, the moth crystals, which tend to be naphthalene or paradichlorobenzene, are used by some people. They're still on the market. I would try to do things mostly with sanitation and sealing things in, in um, tight containers. I will say though, for some of our insect uh, colonies, uh, which insects uh, these these carpet beetles will eat. We will use moth crystals in little tiny boxes that we put in, and we usually choose paradichlorobenzene because it's less flammable than the mothballs, uh, but they both have that sort of distinctive um, odor that a lot of people don't like. And it's not that it's repelling the insects so much. There's some repellency, but it's killing the insects. But remember, all these things, the, uh, the DDVP, the mothballs, the crystals, they're volatilizing and they're only gonna last a certain period of time before they're gone. So they would have to be replenished. So finishing up store product pest management, it deals with prevention, monitoring, and then when all else fails, some of the control strategies. But prevention is, is essential if you can do it because it really is uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So with that, I want to thank you for listening, and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions or go back to Humming uh, Love Shack uh, by the B-52s. Thank you, Dr. Benson. This has been especially helpful for me as I'm starting to get out some of my winter clothes. I'm yeah. starting to pack up some of the summer clothes. Since it has dipped into the 70s, I know the cold weather is going to come soon. So yes. any, anybody out there with a, with a question, if you could go ahead and type that in, we can get that answered for you. 
while we're waiting for questions, uh, Eric, I'm curious about um, these these grain pests, I guess, weevils and those kinds. If the larvae is in the grain, is that sort of a manufacturing defect? Is that something that should have been taken care of? Or all grains, like if they sit there long enough, larvae can, 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 can grow? Yeah, more of the, the latter, Mark. Um, you know, grain can get infested, but it's, it's not necessarily the fault of the, the producer, you know, unless they left it in an area where the insects were and they weren't doing control. So, you know, in commercial settings, in warehouses, in silos, uh, they're, they're, they're doing a lot of things. They're fumigating. You know, we didn't even talk about fumigation, but they're, they're doing a lot of things to try to avoid that. It's usually these small batches, people doing their own uh, harvesting, uh, where the, the grain is left out or forgotten, and then these pests get in and, and go to town. See, we did have a question about control strategies. Um, this comes from Phil. Would heat treatment be more effective as freezing seems harder to achieve? Yeah, that's a good question. Heat treatment can be very effective. Heat treatment is often more effective and more toxic than freezing, but you have to be set up to do it. Uh, so the average person, uh, well, if it's clothing and you put it in a dryer, that would work. So you could heat clothing in a dryer. If you have a pantry situation, it's harder to heat up your pantry because usually what you have to do is heat it to 135 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit and probably hold it for about six hours. They can do, they can do that kind of heat treatment for bed bugs and such, but the average person can't really do that. So it's easier usually if you're going to keep it at all is to take that bag and put it in the freezer. Uh, but insects in general are more sensitive to high temperature than low temperature. We tend to think, oh, they're cold-blooded animals. They don't like, you know, they're going to die if they freeze. Actually, they're very good at tolerating cold. So heating is, can be very effective. It's just hard to do it well. Thank you. Um, anyone else have questions? And, and while we're waiting for the questions, Mark, is it okay if we go ahead and put those couple of survey questions up? Yeah, let's go ahead and I will do that right now. Okay. Mark, should I get rid of my... Yeah, if, if, you, if you want to stop sharing, you, 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 you can. Stop share, okay. Yeah. Folks, I've launched that poll. Go ahead and uh, enter your responses there. That just helps us uh, let us know what we're doing right or wrong. When I am putting up some of my clothes, some of my summer clothes for the for the winter, and I and I'm gonna you know gonna do what you have told me to, and use some of the the sealable bags. And you talked about washing the clothes first. Is there any anything special to do when you're washing? Is it just a regular wash? No, a regular wash will will do it, and uh, and and more than the washing, the the drying. So if it's clothes that you can wash and dry. Uh, that's that's basically going to kill anything that might be on your your clothing. But then, you know, don't leave it out too long before you put it in one of those airtight bags to, uh, you know, store it for any length of time. Or if you dry, if it's something that's going to be dry clean, yeah, take it to the dry cleaner, and as soon as you get it back, put it into one of those those airtight bags, and you should be fine. Okay. Well, Eddie is asking about the uh pesticides like foggers that are often used for flea yeah. would yeah. this be something to use in the home for some of these pests no good question eddie uh no <laughs> uh i'm not a big fan of foggers uh foggers are like a, uh taking a can an aerosol can basically that you you know you spray with your finger all it is really you just push down the the, the little applicator and you run out of the room until the whole thing dispenses and it puts insecticide everywhere but you certainly don't want to use that at pantry pests right on around food stuffs that you're probably going to be eating if you put it into a closet with clothing and you put insecticide everywhere well this may be insect the clothing that you're later wearing on your skin and then plus foggers do not penetrate well because they're not a fumigant it's just insecticide uh, aerosol going all over the room. So if I'm a case making clothes moth and I'm under the lapel of the woolen suit, then insecticide is not going to get to me. I'm already protected in the case that I'm in and then probably under the lapel. So they're quite ineffective. 
uh, what the, the, the strip, so you might say, well, you talked about that DDVP. That's a little more insidious. You just hang it, and it slowly puts out this volatile in the air, and then when these insects crawl around, uh, it tends to get to them more readily. But the foggers have not been found to work very well. Thank you. We have, we have a couple more. Um, Paul asked if we purchase organic foods, organic grains, are we more likely or just as likely to find pests as food processed with pesticides? I, th I think you're just as likely. Um, I haven't noticed a difference um, between organic and, and, and foods that are processed in a non-organic way. I mean, hopefully, even if it's, if it's not organic, you're still known to have a, a high residue of insecticides uh, on that, that product. So sometimes what I see with some of these um, food co-ops, organic places, sometimes they're just not storing their food well. They'll have big barrels or big bins of food and the same principles apply. If they're not doing stock rotation, monitoring, checking, then sometimes you'll get insect pests in there that, that you, again, you could, might get and then bring home. But in general, I wouldn't say there would be a difference between the propensity to get some of these pests in organic versus non-organic. Thank you for that answer. Um, anybody else have questions before we wrap up? Anyone? Well, Dr. Bitson, we thank you very much. This has been great and very informative. And we hope to see... We hope to see everyone back in um, December when we have a presentation by Alan Brown on don't let bed bugs hamper your vacation plans. So we will see you then. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Dr. Benson. Thank you, Mark. Great, folks. I'm going to put a link to the, again, to the Learn event in chat. Uh, again, uh, we'll have a recording there within a few days. Feel free to share that with colleagues or friends who might not have been able to join us. And thank you again for your time, Eric. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, folks. Bye-bye. Take care.